Welcome to episode four, series four of the Fishing Daily podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Eamon Nixon, who is a member of NIFA and the secretary of the Irish Inshore Fishermen's Association. And I am also joined by John Minari, who is on the board of directors of the National Inshore Fishermen's Association. And we'll be talking about the situation that's facing the Irish inshore sector at this moment. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, welcome, Oliver. Yeah. Thank you. So Brexit, COVID, uh, poor prices for product, uh, rising fuel costs, uh, bad weather, now Pollock ban. Um, what's it been like for you, your members um, the past few years? Um, I'll well, go, for, go on. Sorry, John. I was just going to say it's getting to the stage, Oliver, where they're not coping. It's getting the stage where bills aren't getting paid. People are falling behind with their their household bills, their mortgage payments. We have one member who's actually trying to file for uh, insolvency, and because of it, he's in such a dire state, he can't even afford the fee for to file for insolvency. So to say the situation is dire is is an understatement. It's one of those things where the, the fishing industry is mainly made up of men and men are very slow to talk about their problems. But I think there's a, there's a real serious situation at the minute where people aren't talking about the problems they're going through. And I think it's something that just to, to start off by highlighting that, that I think guys are in real financial dire straits, but they're just not... They're not, not talking about it. They're trying to keep their head down. They're trying to get into the fishing season. They're trying to get through it. But I think there's a real there's a real darkness coming over the insure industry at the minute. And if we don't if we don't get some sort of financial help, I don't know where the industry is going. Where where guys are going to? I don't know where guys are going to see a future. Like there's no. What are guys going to do if they can't catch fish? That's what they're supposed to do. That's what fishermen do. And if we don't have fish to catch. And or if we don't have markets to sell what we do catch, it's we're in a, a dire situation at the moment, I think. And this this is going really back to all starting stemming back really to COVID times. Where markets collapsed or, or dried up and we got little or no financial supports then, and then we were thrown into the thrust of Brexit, where one part of the industry was <coughs> excuse me, very well taken care of with over 160 million spent on one sector of the industry and then short sector knows the AM puts the figure of almost 95 percent of the fleet is made up within short sector we have got very less, less than five million in times and ways of financial support so when that's when you're considering that 50 vessels in the pelagic sector got almost 26 million amongst amongst them for losses and then shores looking at five million it's it's really a, a tale of two halves, the have the haves and the have nots. So something needs to be done to support the guys that are, are, are truly suffering now. Just to, just on that, I think, Oliver, hmm. you know, just to burn a little bit on what John said there. Um, I think going back to definitely back to COVID and that hit us all very hard at the time. And I suppose that hit everybody across the country, not just fishermen. But I think when you go to Brexit, Brexit again hit the entire country, but certainly did not hit anybody as hard as the fishing industry. And I think, you know, we recognise that we lost more of some quotas than others. But then when it came to compensation, like the the whole and 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 I, I'm saying this as and hold my hand up as somebody who was representing the inshore sector on the task force at the time. And I know we held various amounts of subgroup meetings trying to bring together not just myself, I involved a lot of other guys up and down the coast and we took an awful lot of different ideas to the people that was administering the the our, 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 were, were the guys from both BIM and the department who were kind of uh, being the leaders of how things were being done inside in the task force at the time an awful lot of ideas were taken to them and I think you know when you look at the way people were compensated some people were compensated as John said in the task force post pelagic and whitefish we were told that we had absolutely no right to any compensation uh, for either pelagic quotas or for whitefish quotas now 
um, you know, we have we have an allocation of mackerel as small as it is, and it's only minute, but we do have an allocation of them. Uh, and we also have uh, allocations of herring in different areas. And we also have uh, we have a two to one ratio or call it whatever you want under under 55 meter vessels uh, get a half of, uh, of of whatever the over 55s get. So if an over 55 meter or an over 55 foot vessel gets one percent, then an inshore vessel should be getting a half a percent of quota for whatever species it would be. That was not taken into consideration in the task force, even though the task force wasn't about compensating people for something that happened in the past. The task force was meant to be compensation for what we are now, what is now happening us. We, the pressure we are under now was expected because of lack of quota cuts and stuff. Everybody knew that was coming down the road, but they decided the powers that be in this country decided to ignore to ignore that and to, uh, to not allow the insure sector. And I, when I say the insure sector, again, and just to be absolutely one hundred percent correct here, uh, a small number of insure vessels did qualify for it now, and I mean a very small number qualified for the whitefish tie-up scheme, but the majority. Uh, uh, I'd say 90% at least, if not 95% of the insure sector didn't, even though that we all hold, uh, 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 um, or the majority of fishermen hold a polyvariant license that e gives them equal access or equal rights. I, everybody's always talking about rights, gives them equal rights to quota share the same as everybody else. That was not taken into consideration. For some reason, it was decided to dismiss that. That was a massive mistake. And that is now coming home to roost. It's absolutely it has ruined the inshore sector because everybody is struggling, as John said. Every fisherman, no matter who you'll talk to in the inshore sector, is struggling. It, and it's not just because of the poor prices. We've had some poor prices before, but it's been a sustained uh, time frame of it between, uh, as we said, COVID, Brexit, but particularly Brexit. And the vessels that got tie ups there, the whitefish vessels, all got tie ups, some of them in the range of 60, 50, 60,000 euros of a tie up every time and there was two or three of them in each of the years there that gave them at least some bit of a of, of a, a cushion to be able to take what's coming down the road at the moment we got what, what what and again wasn't the payments we got did not come out of the task force or so we're told by bim anyway they weren't out they didn't come out of the brexit adjustment fund they came out of exchequer funding and a lot of inshore fishermen weren't able to get those payments because of that because a lot of them had reached their de minimis levels already and they weren't just able to if they had a second boat or something most of them weren't able to claim anything because the the as you know once you reach i think it's thirty thousand over the three years that's your limit your absolute limit limit on any de minimis aid so therefore if you go over that you can't get it and that's what happened some guys like and you know and that that was a shame another thing we were told when we were inside in that task force and i don't want to be going back but this this is what has killed us and is killing us at the moment we were told there couldn't be two schemes for anybody but at the end of the day it ended up that there became a loophole where uh, whitefish vessels and pelagic vessels particularly the ones who have uh, dual licenses that's doing pelagics and whitefish they were able to get both schemes they got, they got both pelagic and whitefish schemes and we were still left with what I would call a fuel scheme maybe at best at the end of the day that came out of exchequer funding so the, the reasons we're in trouble now are not our own to be honest the, the reasons we're in trouble now is because we were ignoring ignored and not properly looked after when the funding was there. And I think I seen the part from one of your own um, podcasts or something back there some time ago, uh, or, or one of the ones on, the, on Fish and Daily where I think that money is probably gone back now and isn't available anymore. And it's just a shame that the insure sector were ignored in it, to be honest. Yeah, the, 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 work, the figures work out that there was about 318 million there for to spend on the on the Irish fishing industry between the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund and other funding. And 178 million of it was spent. You know, there there was plenty of scope there for the minister to uh, reach out and, and, and to help uh, and a, a struggling sector, a very important sector because it, it does employ a lot of a lot of people and right around the coast. I think uh, yeah. for, sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's important to point out that like Dinshore is nothing against what was given out to the other parts of the industry. It's 
our grievances with the minister and what wasn't done for us. And as you point out, Oliver, the money was there. It just wasn't spent. And I think there was a lack of political will to support the, the insurance sector for whatever reason. Like as Eamon pointed out, we all have polyvalent licences. My licence is the same as any other vessels in the country. So to say one was entitled to something and I, I wasn't just because I came from the insurance sector seems to be a recurrent theme with the government, whether it's with pelagic quota allocations or anything else. It's a case of if you're lucky enough to be on the right side of it, you're well looked after. And if you're not, well, you're you're forgotten about. You're just totally discriminated against, in fact. Well, if you look at the coastline, if you look at the Irish coastline, it's dotted with small harbours. And once upon a time, all those small harbours maybe had two half decres, maybe, and a couple of punts or something out there. And they all supported people, you know, and now there's less and less of them. But in the government's mind, they're only looking at the big ports. They're not looking at what's really uh, supporting the coastal communities. It's, uh, Killy Beggs will support Killy, the area of Killy Beggs. Castletown Bear will support the area of Castletown Bear. You know, uh, Rossaville will support. But between Killy Beggs and Rossaville, there's a lot of coastal communities between Rossaville and Castletown Bear, there's a lot of coastal communities. And within those communities, without the income that's coming from the insured sector, there's basically there there is no community left. People people have to leave. Absolutely true. That's the truest thing you ever said. And that is happening in our communities, unfortunately. And we've been telling this to people and they're not listening. That has been happening uh, on a daily basis for the last two or three years because it is just not viable for them, for young people to stay here any longer, even to take over one time. You know, in the past, it was a great thing for any family to be able to hand a fishing vessel over to a younger member of the family, be it a son or a daughter or whatever it should be, brother or younger brother or something. That isn't viable anymore because you can't, I've two young lads myself, I cannot say to one of them, well, do you know, would will you come stay fishing with me? You, you can make a decent living out of this. It's just uh, almost absolutely uh, impossible for them to do that. I, I to be too much of a burden. I just wouldn't ask them in a few years time they'd be saying dad why did you ask me to do this uh you know when you knew yourself uh, you were struggling to make a living how did you expect me to be able to survive at it as well so it's it's just not viable it's very sad because i think you know you you know yourself and everybody knows that um inshore fishing is uh strategic in the way we do it in pots and trawling and and jigging and everything else it all takes time and there's a learning process and you know you just can't bring somebody out and say oh do this or do that and they're going to learn automatically they're not it takes time to to teach any young lad to become a good fisherman and you know it's a shame if, if when that happens and the next thing then after a period of time they have to walk away purely and not for that they don't like the job or anything but purely because it's not financially viable like you know and as you said there's no there's absolutely no support or no intervention there to help us to hold them or to keep them or do anything with them as well. And and one time you'd be saying that was for crew. That's almost for for vessel owners now as well. It's just become that bad. Well, it's a serious financial commitment to to buy a boat or take over a boat. Um, fishing gear costs a lot of money. You know, you have to go and you you have to get your licenses. That takes that takes time and money because you. You're not going to be handed anything if you're if you're going to be doing stuff like that there. And, you know, for such a large section of, of, of the, the Irish fishing fleet, you know, um, what's it, you, he's, John said there, 95%. Uh, it, it may be the biggest fleet, but it has the smallest share of, of the quota. And uh, NIFA is looking for a fair and viable share of the quota. What, what does that look like uh, for you? Uh, well, I, I I I can deal with uh, mackerel, the hook and line mackerel. Anyway, I leave John maybe to talk about the northwest herring. Um, 
like hook and line mackerel, for instance, is I suppose it's a fishery that we've been developing over a number of years now. It basically kind of started taking off after the salmon finished really or shortly after that because there was no alternative. Um, crab fishing was probably already being, you know, there was a fair uh, lot of people at crab and lobster and stuff. So there was some boats were looking for alternatives and they, certainly uh, some of them went into the line of trying jigging because there was a lot of talk as well at the time about you know having more sustainable fisheries and having better uh, managed uh, longer term sustainability in, in in fishing and also you know the the environmental aspect of it uh, the hook and line has has a very low carbon footprint and it's it's a, it's a very environmentally friendly fish it's no bite catches or no waste whatsoever like what you catch is landed and uh, short trips and all of that kind of thing but we we went down the line and I think Eris Inshore, my own organisation here at home, was one of the first we went through the Northwest Rift and we wrote to the Minister back, I think it was even in Michael Creed's time, looking to have um, the, the uh, quota share for the Hookan line increase. Like I think even back when there was a much larger mackerel quota, the hook and line um, quota at the moment has been on a fixed allocation of 400 tonne for as long as I can remember the last lock of years um, and hasn't changed. Uh, I know there was policy reviews, I think, in 10 and 17 and, and in 2010 and 2017, but the hook and line wasn't considered in any of them. Uh, there was the other other methods was, but hook and line wasn't. So there was no change in the hook and line. Um, but there needs to be a lot of boats at, at the moment. Last year, I suppose there was up to 60, 70, maybe even 80 boats fishing it there all along, but boats from Donegal as far south as Ackle Head in May, or even there was some boats at it, I think, even south of Ackle last year. But it, it provides a huge opportunity to an awful lot of small communities, as you said yourself there, Oliver, that we don't land into the bigger ports. OK, some of the fish has to go away to be processed there, all right, but we're landing into all of the small harbours all the way along the coast. Now, there was regulations introduced through quota management uh, over the last number of years that has made it even more unviable because a lot of those uh, regulations are very hard to actually adhere to. Um, and they also um, are, are done in a way that it makes it almost impossible for the boats that are at it to land the quota because we have a monthly, uh, there's a monthly allocation there. And once a boat lands that, he has to go away and tie up. He's not allowed back out again. And therefore, uh, once all of the boats as to get that allocation landed and there's a lot of fish sometimes left there that hasn't been caught and won't be caught because uh, fish as you know yourself don't really know no boundaries they don't always stay in an area for that long they move around they can be off the coast today and god knows where they are could be off scotland or down off france or somewhere next week like so they do move but um We've we, we've followed every single uh, avenue that we know are are are, are heard of to try and influence the minister to uh, increase the who can line allocation. But to date, uh, as I say, we haven't been able to do it. And like an awful, sometimes they say it takes something different to change policy and stuff. There's been so many major changes over the last number of years. Uh, like you know, as I said earlier on, there the entire in um, inshore industry makes up 95% of the fishing fleet in Ireland at the moment. That in itself is a monumental change from what you would have had back in the days when the hook and line fishery began. So to say at the moment, I suppose the hook for the 400 ton of an allocation is less than 1% of the national quota. So 95% of the national fleet has less than 1% of the quota. 5% of the Irish fishing fleet own 95 or uh, don't own it, but they have access to 95% of the Irish mackerel quota. That's a staggering uh, figure, a staggering statistic, no matter how you look at it. Like we, I'm sure you're aware we've been to Linster House once or twice and we've spoken to par um, deputies from all parties up there and an awful lot of them cannot understand how this has been allowed to happen for so long and there hasn't been a change made to it. There needs to be an immediate change to the way that mackerel is allocated. That hook and line quota has to be increased sooner uh, immediately because if it isn't then the vessels that are trying very very hard to, to keep the, as I say, keep the 
the markets that they developed and stuff and try and keep crews and stuff to be able to fish them, they are going to disappear very quickly if something doesn't happen very soon to help us to uh, uh, increase that quota. Yeah, I could never understand about what happens in fisheries is the fact that the salmon fishery is a very valuable fishery to communities. And that was taken away uh, using 2006. Uh, EU, yeah, using EU legislation by the government. And they never replaced that valuable fishery anything. I would say they sent boats to fish crabs, but you know, at the day for, <laughs> in order to be able to make the, anywhere near that you on crab you make, could make on, on salmon, you'd need to fish the whole year, which is nearly impossible for a lot of the small fleet to do. They never really replaced that. Anything, anything of the value that, that, that the salmon fishing was worth. No, absolutely not. And you're dead right. And like you would need to fish crab all year round and that's not going to be possible for the size of vessels that we have. It's, you know, to work off the northwest coast here, it's uh, you would need a much larger vessel if you're going to go year, all year round. We're looking to be able to get six, seven, eight months tops out of it. But no replacement. And, and to be fair to the guys, you know, and both on the processing side and marketing side and on the fishing side, there was an awful lot of good work done by a lot of people to try and develop the fishery itself, both at sea and then on land to get like markets was a huge problem in the beginning, but there was a lot of work done to try and at least reach out to some people to buy the fish. And that has been worked very hard on over a number of years. And now there is a certain amount of a market there. In fact, there's actually was a marketing report report commissioned last year by the minister. We still haven't been able to get a hold of it. It's somewhere tied up in the annals of BIM. And uh, we were told there recently that it wasn't appropriate for us to have it at the moment by a senior official in BIM. I don't know what the story is with it. Nobody can seem to answer, but it's just terrible that, you know, we're being, I, I, I said it the other day, I think at a meeting that we're being treated in ways as like children that we're expected to believe all these things that these reports aren't finished and they're gone here and they're gone there and stuff and at the end of the day no accountability as to why there hasn't been an increase and in the uh, who can lie in quota and as you said um you know it's just it's it's it, it was a, 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 in ways as a replacement for the salmon it certainly gave an opportunity like as i say everybody couldn't diversify into into uh crab and lobster it just wasn't possible then some guys went at gillnets but as you well know that that fishery kind of a lot of those opportunities got taken away as well the cod was closed for for a time in area seven i think and possibly in area six as well and there was other fisheries there but they all every one of them the hook and line mackerel was the only one that uh guys really worked on and tried to keep it alive all the time and it, and it's still absolutely vital to uh, uh small boats all around the country and as i say you know sometimes it said oh that's only a fishery off the northwest coast that's not true anybody can come and fish mackerel that wants to off the northwest coast there's no problem whatsoever and land into any harbour they want and that fish is there these times, God knows where it'll be next year, the year after, it could be down off the Cork or Kerry coast or somewhere. So, like you know, it's it, it's a fishery for for all small boats all around the country, and, and it's an opportunity for them to try and make some money, especially when the weather is good in the middle of summer as well. It allows for that opportunity, Oliver. Before going to the Northwest Heron, maybe to, to touch briefly on the how quotas are shared out in Ireland first. The way yeah. we touched on earlier about the the white fish were a vessel over fifty five foot gets sort of two thirds compared to a vessel under 55 foot gets one third. And it was a situation where there was an allocation to the polyvalent sector that was shared out on a monthly or basis at quota management, where vessels got a monthly allocation, well, or polyvalent vessels got a monthly allocation, but then there was a, a policy review and basically that polyvalent share of the micro was privatised and it was gifted. But I think 27 vessels share that polyvalent micro now. And out of that, which was 12% of the national quota, and out of that 12%, 2.5% of the 12% is made available then to the, the rest of the fleet. 
for like for by catches and etc. And other fisheries. And as Eamon pointed out, there's then four hundred ton allocated for a hook and line fishery. So it's Irish quotas have been based, pelagic quotas have been basically privatized by ministerial policy. Uh, pelagic quotas in this country were one time there was an allocation set aside for the polyvalent sector that all polyvalent vessels had fair and equal access to in relation to their size. Then ministerial policy was drafted up where that 12% of the micro allocation that was allocated to the polyvalent sector was basically privatised for 27 vessels and those 27 vessels now have sole use of that polyvalent allocation and there's a small menu, 2.5% 2, 2 of the 12% allocated to the rest of the polyvalent sector along with the 400 tonnes that's set aside for them, the hook and line mackerel. And it's kind of in stark contrast to the the government's own statement on the Quota Management Committee where it says, in Ireland, quota is a public resource and is managed to ensure the property rights are not granted to individual operators. This is seen as a critical policy in order to ensure that quotas are not concentrated in the hands of large fishing companies who owners of the financial resources to buy up such rights in Ireland. In Ireland, any movement towards privatisation and concentration of rights into the hands of large companies would seriously risk the fishing vessels losing an economic link with Ireland's coastal communities and undermining the social economic importance of the fish fishing industry in the coastal communities dependent on fishing. Like that's the own gov that's the government's own wording on quota on their quota management committee. Yet we have ministerial policies that have that go fly in the face of that and have done exactly the opposite. Yet we have to listen to the minister constantly telling us that oh he needs to see a re a, a substantial change before he can change that. But why can why have you the minister's own policy and saying one thing and then his policy? Doing exactly the opposite. We have the same situation with the Northwest Herring, where we all all polyvalent vessels had access to it. Then when the minister reviewed it now back in 2012, there was a stipulation where a vessel had to catch a certain amount of fish within its in a certain time frame to be considered to have track record. But at the same time, even though vessels under 10 meters would have fulfilled the criteria to have a track record in the fishery. We were all excluded solely on the basis of being under 10 metres. So to say that there's not discrimination in the industry is just absolutely false because it's in the minister's own statement. As you can see it online where I think it was the Minister Coveney at the time reviewed it. And like the whole under 10 metre fleet, the largest sector of the fishing industry was excluded from a fishery solely based on size alone. So there's obvious discrimination in the fishing industry and this is something that not only NEFIT and if and other organisations have been pushing the minister hard to try and get it rectified. But we're facing a, a stone wall. We, we as Eamon says we get we get keep getting told for others to get for others to get more, for some to get more, others would have to take less. But it's not a case. It's not even a case of that. I would put it for the, us that have nothing to get anything. Those that have it all would have to take a little bit less, which doesn't sound as bad. But it's up to the minister to to do it. Because like going back to what we started talking about at the start of the this, we need money, but we also need fish to catch. It's because if if we don't have anything to catch them. We're not fishermen. That's what we do. Going back to 2000 and the North West, West Herring. There were sales documents. Would sales documents not have been charged VAT or some sort of revenue uh, tax on sales? It, it, I'll tell you how blatant the discrimination was. We, we had, we have two members one vessel was over 10 metres, the other was under 10 metres. But even the under 10 metre, to have him self covered in case of an eventuality of needing a track record, he had a logbook also, a European doc, legal document that when he fills it out, that's legally binding. Like if he fills it out wrong, he could have been taken to court for issues with it. 
the mm -hmm. two vessels fished together, landed fish. The vessel that was over 10 meter was lucky enough and was granted a track record and is in the what's called the ring fence fishery. His partner vessel, solely on the basis of being under 10 meters, regardless of track record or his catch or anything else, was excluded and is in the, what's called the non ring fence sector now. So that's 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 just fact. That's how it was dealt with at the time. These issues that's that's happening to the insure sector, do you think it's coming the fact of representation? Uh, do you think the insure sector is underrepresented and when when something like this happens? Um I in it, I don't. I'm not sure it's under representation. It is in ways, as yeah. And to be fair, it's only as you know yourself, Oliver, with the last year or two that uh, NIFA have been able to get PO status. And I suppose Imroy got it a while before, and they have ensure representation as well. Um, but it's one thing like NIF has been there for the past um, ten years now. I think nearly if uh, are coming close to it anyway. Which uh, at the moment I'm chair of, but like we've been taking these issues to the minister and to a forum over all of that time where you know they were being discussed and everything else. But at the same time, there has been absolutely no uh, headway whatsoever been made on the majority of issues. I can't remember two issues or three that we still have had a, a successful outcome to over those eight or ten years that I've been involved in in NIF. Now, NIF hasn't probably been going long enough in fairness to be able to say for sure if they would be able to resolve some issues. But uh, I think it's, it's it, the other thing about it is it, it's equal representation. We've been saying this for the last while and John knows this better than I do and I'm sure he'll come in here in a minute when, when you talk about quota management, like there are some significant committees, like we'll, we'll say, like the management committee of Northwest Herring, the management committee of the Celtic Sea Herring Fishery, the management committee for co quota management, which manages all the main committees. There, there, there. Those, those are made up of people from the fishing sector and from the different state agencies. But there's, a, 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 at the moment, from the larger part of the fishing sector, they're not, uh, there, there is representation from uh, each one of those organisations in there, and Inshore has um, one, two representatives majority. Um, we need to have equal representation in the rooms for all committees. There needs to be equal uh, representation from in short, the same as there is from the larger POs. We need that, unless that, that's there, we can never have a, a fair debate then about, and if you have a partial chairman and you have a fair debate, then you should. I know, and I'm all the time listening to p people saying to us that, in, particularly in the department, that, you know, oh, um, nothing is ever decided in court of management on a voting basis, but that is not true. And I'd say John will be able to give you two or three recent issues that has gone to code of management and they haven't been able to get over the line because of um the because of the way numbers and views are stacked up inside in those committees it's not just code of management the same could have been said for the northwest herring that committee is 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 kind of insolvent at the moment because there's so many issues with it but um until such day as we get equal representation in there for, in in all of those committees from our sector then we're never going to be able to make any headway there's no future for us if we can't do that. That, in my view. Yeah, no, sorry. I was just going to say, like as Eamon says, if you don't like, we have, if you don't have fair and equal representation, we us us in NIFA, we have almost two hundred members. As one PO, we we nearly represent as many vessels as the other POs combined. Yet when we're in the room, we're only one voice. There's no weight given to how many vessels you represent, and I think that's probably that'll never. Be rectified when you have a situation where you have POs at the moment, maybe only representing maybe 30, 35 vessels. Have the same same shout as a PO representing 200 vessels. And we we're always told we, that a quota management that the minister likes us to reach a consensus. But when we're talking about the haves and the have nots, trying to reach a consensus, and I, I you can under, fully understand from the other POs perspective they have the fish they don't want to give it up they're struggling also but it's up to the minister 
to make the hard decisions, but he hides behind the situation of where, oh, we like to get a consensus and maybe go back and talk about it again or try and reach something. It's never going to happen. We have the situation with the Northwest Herring Committee where there was two inshore representatives, two vast, two, two, two voice seats at the table representing the vast majority of the non-ring fence sector and the rest of the POs representing people in the ring fence sector. Like you're talking the other, P, other POs representing 57 vessels and we're trying to fight there for the, basically for the rest of the fleet and expected to reach consensus and have amicable outcomes. It's never going to happen. It's It seems to be the way that the department and the minister is trying to wash their hands of what goes on in the um, between the industry at the minute. When he set up that committee, he wanted it sort of set up by the industry and run by the industry, but it's, it was never never going to work from the start. And it, it wasn't long before it failed. We, we wrote to the minister before, back in November, about the situation. And we had another meeting this year about it last, about a month ago, but still nothing's been done like that. The minister and his department need to take things in hand. They need to start running the show and not sort of hiding behind of this sort of idea that we're all going to come to a happy happy outcome. It's not going to happen until the minister starts taking charge and running the show. Like he he's the, he's the manager of the team and the things aren't being run right. There's unhappiness in all sectors. He needs to to man up and start start taking ownership of the industry that he's supposed to be overseeing and the custodian of and he's at the minute he's not doing a great job in my view well yeah he's made a lot of promises and uh there is not a lot of wit behind behind the promises you know um promises don't pay bills promises don't pay bills exactly and <clears throat> we're looking at you know we're looking at a, a, a very important sector. We keep saying to the coastal communities, to that keeps schools open, that keeps shops open, that keeps you know different things, and you know it, it's on a different. It's treated totally different to Ireland's other traditional um, rural industry, which is which is farming, and you know fishermen don't get any support. You know, uh, I, I had a call uh, back there before Christmas from a, from a young fisherman who was trying to hold on to his two crewmen over 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 uh, December, January, and February, and he was full of suggestions about how the government could help. Um, and he said, has himself and his two crewmen were willing to work even in order to get stolen money. In order to get social welfare money, uh, so that they could stay in the industry. How would uh, an annual financial scheme work? Do you think would that be a, a good imp implementation for the government or for the minister to look at for for the sector? I just I just want to come back in on one thing there, Oliver. Just before we go to that annual, uh, just when you're talking there about rural communities and creating employment in rural communities and sharing of quota as it should be shared, uh, to to create that employment in those rural communities. I was told the other day, and by a fairly reliable source, that in the mackerel alone that was allocated already to the fishing to the Irish fishing industry this year in 2024, I reliably told that definitely over 20% of that, if not even uh, higher than that, fish has been landed into non-EU countries by Irish vessels. Um, like, if you look at that, that's a frightening statistic that that fish has gone into non-EU countries. Like, if that was, if, if, if the, a tiny proportion of that was given to the inshore sector, look at the amount of jobs that would create in Donegal and in Mayo and in Sligo, down the coast in Cork and Kerry, the, be it either through direct landings from vessels or be it in small, you know, there's an awful lot of that mackerel goes into small premises for 
uh, human consumption locally and some of it obviously to processes, but it creates an awful lot of employment. I think that we're told again by BIM that it's probably for every one job at sea, it creates seven on land, I think. So if you look at, uh, I spot, I don't know, I think Ireland's quoted this year for 2024 for macro is somewhere around 45, 48,000 tonnes or something. Like if you 30% of that or 25% of it even, and look at that gone out of the economy here in Ireland and in, in Europe indeed. Um, if you look at even a proportion of that being handed out to the smaller vessels here, it, it's colossal to think like, you know, and again, I, I go back to the political will and, you know, I we're in a time where there's elections right, left and centre up and down the country, both, you know, local elections, European elections and probably a general election within 12 months and stuff. Like we talk to these political representatives that we have. I know we do in Mayo anyway, uh, on a regular basis and stuff, but I'm not sure are they, you know, they are telling us that they're putting the story across. But what's wrong when they can't, this cannot be looked at, you know, politically at a higher level and say, God, how long can we allow the likes of this to go on for? We've got to say stop at some stage and look after our own people. It's not happening, but I would be calling on any politician that listens to this broadcast that's from a coastal community around Ireland. It's time to stepped up to the plate and took some responsibility for what's going on here. Like, you know, we, we can't keep preaching this day in, day out. We, as John said there, we're fishermen. We have to go back and try and make a living. But, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, there are, politic, there are elected political representatives and they do do represent us no matter what county they're from uh, when it comes to re legislation in the state and we need them to stand up for us here at this stage and 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 and, and try and save us at the end and, and I say I don't say that lightly I mean that because I think at this stage the Irish inshore fishing industry definitely needs saving by somebody. Well that's somebody told me one time the thing about a, a politician he'll land at your door before an election and they'll promise you everything and he'll say he'll do this and he'll do that. But once he walks in and signs on the on the line when he goes into the diet and signs on the line, he's no longer representing his constituency, he's representing his party. And it comes down to the fact that we call it that the politicians need to promise to make the changes within their parties that will allow the changes and not make the promises to you at the doorstep. And then uh, six months later, when you're asking them for something, they'll go, well, the side of my hands, it's the party. Yeah, and that's very, very, very true. Yeah, very true. Yeah. So I think it's back to your point is that is promises. Promises don't pay bills. We need actions. Like as Eamon pointed out there, not to think wander too much, but like as Eamon pointed out, BAM said for every job at, at sea, there's seven on shore. Do you take 10 small boats in one corner of the country with two Two people on the deck, that's 20 people on the sea, that's 140 people just depending on those people on land. Like, so 10, 10 small boats with 20 people, it might seem like nothing, but if you told them that somebody down about Guidor about a factory of 140 workers was going to close in the morning, to be uproar about it. But I think that's back to the way fishermen are viewed, we're, few, we're viewed as individuals, and when we've been looking for support, so it's been focused on the individual it's not it's not supports just for the income an individual's income we need we need business supports the same as other people have got same as the hospitality industry same as the any other business there got supports there with the increase in the cost of electricity and everything else our fuel bills went diesel went from 30 cent a liter during covid to 130 a litre there with the Ukraine war. I see just reading in the paper there, it's gone up another 10 to 12 cents in the last week to 10 days. We've got no business supports. But we're we're businesses, a... we're not, it's, it's important to change the, mind, the mindset and how we're viewed. We're not individuals. Fishermen are businesses. You might see a fisherman and think oh, he's only one guy. He only has himself to look after. It's not the case. We're businesses. And even yeah. as we go along, even if we're not getting the money for our catches, if markets are down, our prices are down, we still have the wear and tear in our gear still, excuse me, costs us the same to go to fish. Even more so now since the outbreak of the Ukraine war, costs have gone astronomical. 
Like it's we're not individuals, we're businesses, and that's the way the the government needs to start viewing us as well. Well, that's it. You know, you have you have all you have to go through all the same procedure as a business. Any business has to go through. You know, at the end of the year, you have to present your books. All during the year, you have your running costs. You have everything, but yet and all, it's they don't treat the your business as a business. You know, don't need look at you as you say as as an individual, and that's a that's a that's a, that's a hypocrisy again from 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 the government. Yeah, and I suppose it's back to like we provide a product. We have the fish producers and exporters represented of Brandon Bourne cry, crying out for product. He's saying, I don't know how much they're down this year. But if we don't have the insure sector pro providing product to the other processors throughout the year, like it's not even processors, like there's a whole industry, whole hospitality industry based on providing fresh local produce, like all around the coast, fresh seafood. One of our members there down in Dingle says that's all the restaurants and the cafes and the want they want local produce when they put something on the menu they want to be able to tell you it was Eamon Dixon down the road caught those mackerel this morning and you have them this evening they don't want it covered in breadcrumbs and flown halfway around the world they want it from down the road and the people are willing to pay for it if we can provide it to them but we need access to it and we need to be supported to do that yeah well, when you hear, I heard last summer that we called that there was restaurants being forced to buy uh, farm cod and from foreign countries because they couldn't, they can't get fresh Irish cod, and it really shows you the dire situation that that the whole industry is in, really, from from top to bottom. Uh, if if you're what you called, if if you're Mac, if your macro boats are landing your mackerel abroad, if your whitefish fleet has been cut down to nothing, that there's no processors, and you've got an inshore fleet that can support coastal communities, that's been totally neglected. Um, it doesn't really say much for your for your government. And then you go to Norway, or you go to Iceland, <clears throat> you go to the Netherlands, or you go to Belgium, and you look what they're doing. You know. Uh, the Irish government should be really embarrassed about how they how they actually think about the industry. I I I John, it would be I, I'm not maybe standing up for politicians either in any in in, in any way they're well able to stand up for themselves. I, I think some of them will say that they're not aware of some of the situ of of some of the situation that are occurring in in the industry in particular in the inshore industry but i do think that and and um podcasts like this and, and and other um media outlets will always help to improve that i think maybe over the last while and that's what i say nifa to be fair haven't been long enough really uh, uh, as a po to be to make a substantial um inroads into into getting a better um understanding of all of the inshore issues out into the public domain but i think you know that's what i'm saying to you oliver i think any politician who listens to this or any other similar podcast needs to waken up to the actual reality of what is happening in the industry that the inshore sector has been a forgotten sector for some years now and is being left behind and will be soon buried completely if something isn't done to save us as i said earlier i don't want to be going back over the same words again but somebody has to take a lead here we, we've been knocking on the door of the department officials for a long time now pointing out to them what's gone wrong and we're, we we just seem to end up back at the same crossroads every time and we get the same answers and that's just not viable any longer and that's no good every time we end up there there's some other boat or a couple of boats gone and that just isn't isn't viable and it's not acceptable like you know as i said we live in a country where there's a democracy and we do need to get that question answered by somebody very very soon a clear answer is the irish fishing quota any longer particularly pelagic quotas are they any longer 
a national asset or have, as John said earlier, been privatised? We need an answer to that. That's a very serious question. Uh, I never heard in my time, and I'm over 40 years fishing, that they were ever up for grabs where uh, people trade them among themselves and, and people buying them with large sums of money. But I never seen the government or any government in my time putting them up for sale or saying that they were they were there to be sold. Like you know, So I think somebody needs to come out very soon and clarify for us very clearly, is pelagic quota uh, uh, still a national asset in Ireland or is it now in the hands of individuals? Yeah, I suppose like, like we, we've been asking for support since since COVID times. Nefa, we were up with the minister in the doll, not in the doll, in agriculture house back in 2022 when the shrimp market collapsed. We were there in 2023 when the crab market collapsed. We actually pointed out to the minister where there was monies available that could be used for supports due to the Ukraine war. We were told, no, we were wrong. It wasn't possible. And it wasn't until after that, that money that was available until the sort of the door closed on that, that we were told, oh, yeah, sorry, we made a mistake. There was actually money there, but it's too late now. We can't use that. I've sat, sat through endless meetings with minister, the minister and his officials telling us all the different reasons why they can't help us. And then we get told, go away and come up with something and come back to us. If they would spend five minutes telling us what they can do for us and, or sit around the table with us to discuss what what might work, we might get somewhere. And the, the, it's almost laughable. But we're going to have a minister that's going to shortly announce that there's going to be millions and millions of EMFAF money available to the insure industry and all the rest. But it's going to be the sad reality is that to avail of the EMFAF money, you first of all have to have money to spend. And then it's the case if you spend 100 euros of your own money to get back 50 euros of it, and then the minister will make out that he give you 150 euros. So it's going to be a lot of a creative accounting coming up very shortly, I feel. And the minister will say that he's done wonders for the insure sector and there's all these millions available. But in the sad reality, there's going to be no money going into fishermen's pockets to help them survive. And that's just the way it is at the moment. And as we, as I said, we have a meeting with the minister now on Thursday. What comes of it, I don't know. But unless he comes with sort of meaningful, meaningful, substantial offers or help for us, I don't know where we're going to go from here or who we go to. It's not that we're going to stop. We're going to, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep searching for help for our members. But it's just a case of where we go next. Where do we take our, where do we take our case to? Then who do who do we have to ask for help? Because if our minister is not going to help us, we just have to go elsewhere. Well, I think as well, Oliver, just to and uh, to finish up on it, I think and John has touched on a lot of it there. But, um, you know, we wouldn't need so much. And and as I said, if we had got. A, share, a fair share of the supports that was there in the in the past, particularly the Brexit one, we wouldn't be here tonight probably in this situation talking to you. We could be here talking to you, but probably on a more positive note rather than this, but we weren't. And at, going forward, now we're definitely in a predicament and we do need a little bit of help to get out of here, immediate help. But in the long term, if we get a fairer share of those quotas, particularly Hook and Line Mackerel, Northwest Herring, and there should certainly be some effort made by the Irish government to develop a bluefin tuna coat as well. And this is an issue with spur dogs that needs their alternative fisheries. They need to be sorted. Somebody in the department has to take the bull by the horns here. Go out to Europe. Other countries are able to get quotas at the moment for bluefin tuna. Why aren't Ireland at least trying very hard to get one and coming up with some ideas that we should put them forward for us to get that type of a quota? They, that needs to happen. But if we had those, if we had that little bit more access to those quotas, then we financially would be much more stronger and we wouldn't need nearly as much support. So one go, it's like a chicken and an egg situation. If you have, if you get one, you almost have the other automatically. So if we get that little bit of quota, that will bring us the finance in, 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 to, in, in the longer term as well. Well, that's an interesting one about the bluefin tuna and it's a, a discussion for a, another day. <clears throat> but I was reading about Iceland has a quota for bluefin tuna and they don't use it. You don't find, you know, so Excuse the language. That just frightening. And Ireland, yeah. yeah, and Ireland, Ireland has got bluefin tuna sitting on their doorstep. We're not allowed to fish it. Iceland has a as a bluefin tuna quota, but it's too far away from them. It's not economically viable for them to use it. 
And that's, there you go, as how it all works. Well, thank you for joining us. And hope now on Thursday that uh, you'll come back on Thursday evening with, with better news and news uh, of supports for the industry. And we'll be sitting here in a couple of months time talking about uh, seeing some improvements. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope so, Oliver. Uh, fingers crossed that we will hear something positive on Thursday. A lot of guys around the country has has pinned their hopes on it. So we just, as John said earlier, there we just have to wait and see now until until it's done and dusted. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Oliver.